If this is your first live, oh my gosh, welcome. So your box probably looks something like this. Make sure you've got your glassware ready. Make sure you've got some water to hand. If you're not used to tasting neat spirits, you will be soon, don't panic. How to taste whiskey guide, all ready to go. And you should also have your trusty tasting notes right there. You've got, it didn't work. What do you mean? Are we live? If you can hear us, yeah. put yourselves in the comments. Okay, we're gonna have a funny moment just then. So Giovanna, who you get emails from all the time, she's our founder. She sends us all your messages, by the way. So there's a bit of behind the scenes secret just there. And she is like, are you guys live? I'm like, yeah, I think we are. So I'm glad. Let us know if you're tuning in as well. Please like talk to us. And this is the other thing. You've got your tasting notes. We wanna hear your tasting notes, right, Andy? That's our favorite bit of this. We're a community here, so it's absolutely about sharing tasting notes. As we've always said, there's no right, there's no wrong answers. However weird your tasting notes or you think they're weird, the great thing is hearing everyone's tasting notes. And that's really the most important thing. We're a community discussing it. There really are no right or wrong answers. So please, please get involved with what you're getting from each whiskey. Yeah, for sure. And Paul, how big into tasting notes are you? Are you somebody who like gets into the minutiae of everything or are you just a sip and go kind of person? I think I kind of go both ways. Just always want to really dissect a dread and focus it on individual things. Uh, so, like for events like this, then yeah, I'm going to be all about it and talking about you know the the flavors of this, the flavors of that. Uh, you, know, you can really taste the West Banks of the Loire Red Valley uh, <laughs> in the few rye. Uh, whereas other times, you know what? You can just drink whiskey to enjoy it. Sometimes it's nice just to get a tumbler and just put in something that doesn't require that thought process to drink. You know, do you know what I mean? And just not think about it. But this is not that time. We're discussing right. whiskey. It's yeah, you guys. This is just this is the time to kind of nerd out, kind of geek out a little bit, right. really, really focus and train your palate to be able to pick out those notes. That's exactly yeah. it. 100%. And if you want to add water to your whiskey, do it. If you want to add a little bit of ice, do it. If you want to get creative and mix some cocktails while we're going, get on it. These are your whiskeys. We're here to enjoy them. We're going to chat about them. We want to hear from you. And we've got a handful of people tuning in now, which is excellent. We've got Owen saying good evening. Jay Moon. Hello, Jay Moon. Um, Sean McCarrick saying looking forward to tonight's tasting. So on that note, I feel like we'll outline what we're going to taste. Critical information. Um, I'm gonna kick off chatting about Milk and Honey, which is a distillery that I visited a couple of years ago now. So lucky to get to head out to Tel Aviv to check them out. Then Paul is gonna talk us through Few with Andy, which I'm so excited to hear everything. Um, and then last but not least, we're gonna round off the evening with some Irish whiskey geekery with Waterford, which is gonna be fabulous, right, Andy? I'm really intrigued by all the discussions around this. We've definitely heard so much about Waterford in the last, you know, in the last year. And just seeing those bottles just fly off the shelf. So it's really great to try something. I'm really excited to talk to you guys about what their kind of ethos is behind the whiskey. That's super exciting because it's super, super different. Yeah, 100%. So on that note, Paul, we're going to say bye to you for now. I'm going to zip you off, but please hang around. We need your guidance for a few when we talk. It was all nothing you said. It was nothing you said. <laughs> <laughs> hang around, but we'll see you in a bit. So yeah, come back and join us shortly. He also made frozen, but yeah, we'll zip him off. Hopefully he'll be there for us and it will be good. So Andy, we've got a first question come in, which I'm really interested about, um, from Bruce. This is a great one. What's the best way to prepare my palate for whiskey? I find it takes a sip or two to like calibrate my palate and then everything tastes great. What food or flavors should they be avoiding? I mean, I wouldn't want to eat anything too heavy or spicy or, though it depends though, because sometimes when we talk about Indian whiskey previously, people were like, it was nice to pair it with the curry, but I would, preferably eat something light before nosing and tasting whiskey to really kind of not, you don't want to ruin your palate before you go straight into it because those sometimes it's quite hard to pick out certain flavors. And the last thing you want to do is ruin your palate with something big, heavy meal or something that's quite kind of saucy or something like that. So I'd stick to something like before this one, I actually haven't eaten my dinner properly yet um, because we're not drinking, you know, so we're, we're sipping whiskey. Um, so I've just had like a banana and to kind of a bit of bread to kind of back up my um, my palate. So that's, I think, a good way to kind of calibrate your palate and have something kind of neutral before going into this. What about yourself? Yeah, so Paul's actually just snuck a little comment in, which I didn't know she could, about neutralizing your nose with coffee beans. And that is such a great shout. So I do some spirits judging from time to time. 
Um, I've done things like, you know, the World Whiskey Awards. We're doing World Rum this week, which is fascinating. And honestly, um, if you do have coffee, it's a little reset. And as Paul just said, you can sort of sniff your own arm. Like, as long as you've not got, like, crazy moisturizer on, that will, like, reset everything. And also, I just grab my water. Water is your friend. Just swoosh your palate in between everything. Like, that's going to be really helpful. Some people swear by sparkling water. I just prefer still, but you do. You. Uh, digestive biscuits and kind of uh, are kinds of good in-between drams, especially if you're going from one dram to the other to kind of neutralize your palate before going into the next dram. Someone's actually written here, Guy Wilson, so the Thai curry I've just eaten was a bad idea. <laughs> I mean, is but, it ever a bad idea? <laughs> it's never a bad idea to eat a Thai curry. So, but yeah, I mean, sometimes I prefer to not have something spicy that's going to kind of, uh, before doing a whiskey tasting. Uh, but it's totally up to you guys. Chris Randall, chicken fajitas, Nicholas Stephen, and omelette. We're getting into a food discussion here. Yeah. Right. I'm going to ask back on track here because one, I haven't had dinner yet. And this is just like for me. And also I've got three whiskeys here in front of me. I'm torturing myself with those two. So first up, we are going to take a virtual trip to Tel Aviv. We've got milk and honey, the classic single ball. Now, I'm just going to have a little chit chat here, but Andy, feel free to join in as well. Um, I got to go and visit these guys in like the middle of 2019. And oh my gosh, this was just a really brilliant trip. I've written about it on the Master of Malt blog if you want to check it out, but I'm also going to like dip into like my memories um, for pour and sip on the PNS Digest later this month. So the thing that I really love about this distillery, well, first of all, the people behind it are amazing. They're so forward thinking, super liberal, really like just experimental in kind of like loads of ways, but particularly with whiskey making. And what they've really done there, um, they've harnessed kind of like the, the climate um, of Tel Aviv and also down by the Dead Sea to kind of like do everything they can to speed up maturation a little bit. I feel like with a lot of new distilleries, um, and these guys are great. They worked with um, the late Dr. Jim Swan, who you probably heard of if you're into like your sort of new whiskies a little bit. He was a consultant who set up loads of people. Um, I think he worked with the guys at Kilhoman, loads and loads and loads and loads. And one of the things that he really believed in was these STR casks. I feel like I'm jumping all over the place with this, but bear with me. What is an STR cask? Shaved... Um, toasted and recharred. So you're basically like doing everything you can to the inside of the cask to get the maximum out of it, the maximum amount of flavor. So after he's done all of this to the oak, he's then seasoned it with like red wine cask. So you're getting like this maximum amount of fruitiness possible from it. And sometimes it feels like a bit too much. I think if you had like a fully matured STR cask, it would be a bit like, whoa, what is this? This is all fruit flavors, all this going on. So this one's got some other stuff going on too. It's got some virgin oak and some ex bourbon cask to like chill it out a bit which is fabulous. Um, but I think I'm just, feel free to nose and taste by the way while we're chatting and I'll drop your taste. They, always, they always jump well ahead of us, Christy, so we don't have to worry about that. And I mean, why wouldn't you, right? You've got some amazing whiskies here. Like, you know, I will geek out about this for a long time. Um, but yeah, so some of the things that I thought was really cool about this distillery. So it was brand new. The first distillation run they did was in 2015. So we're talking like super recent. Like these whiskies only came of age. I, I think the first release they did yeah it was like 2018 2019 and there was like a few limited runs this is the first like core expression they they ferment for like 72 hours so that's not like crazy long but it's like long enough to get some of these like real like orchard fruit notes that i'm getting through um i can see some taste notes so david saying like creamy honey chocolate i for sure get milk chocolate this is such this is like an easter dram for me it's very fitting that we're tasting it today um and then sean's talking about a floral nose with a dollop of honey sweetness like for sure like it's so interesting but we need to talk about the dead sea situation so it's like below sea level significantly 430 meters below sea level i don't really understand how this works geographically and how it's created it's very very cool um but it gets super hot there as well like 50 degrees celsius and i think the water is something like over nine times saltier than the sea so you've got this really hot climate really salty um below sea level like there's nowhere else like that really on the world and they're maturing whiskey there and that just blows my mind. And what that does, it just really accelerates all of this fruit forwardness coming out. And um, when we were there, we tasted samples that were like 18 months old and they tasted like fully mature whiskey. Um, they noted that it would be way too much to fully mature casks there. And I think it's right. I don't know about you, Andy, but on the nose, I'm getting so much of that fruit already. Yeah, kind of like a rich kind of a, oh, you're frozen on me there, Christy. I don't know if that's you or me. Okay. <laughs> I think it's you. Uh, like a kind of peach nose 
as well. Mm. Lots and lots and lots of honey for me, like really sweet honey, which is wonderful. And um, someone else mentioned it as well, those kind of flapjack notes as well, and kind of oatmeal biscuits, which is really, really lovely. This is actually my first time really, really nosing this as well. I do remember that the whiskey show two years back, because unfortunately last year's got cancelled due to COVID, Milk and Honey was one of the most popular sands. Honestly, it had a queue like out the door for Milk and Honey, and there's a reason for it. Um, and yeah, though, this is really, really nice. A kind of hint of kind of floral oak and sultanas, raisins as well in there. Yeah, it's a really nice notes. Have we tried it yet? No. Uh, we haven't. Let's have a sip. So cheers. First round for the night, everyone. Cheers. Happy April. Hmm. Yes. Uh, just how I remember it. Talking with my mouth with a whiskey right there. Um, for me, on the palate, it's a real continuation of all that fruit. And then it even gets creamier, I think. It's such a creamy, creamy mouthfeel. And then you get loads of sweet spices. For me, like loads of cinnamon, a little bit of nutmeg. Um, somebody's put, who was it? I saw in the comments. Scott, he was saying it's like Greg's fudge donuts. I can't speak to Greg specifically, but donuts. I feel like this is like a donut, a puddingy, a rich, a mouth filling -y kind of a vibe. So, so great. Yeah, there's a lot of good tasting notes coming in. Simon, honey and dark fruit, Eddie Marshall, blackberry cum, crumble and custard on the nose. We're definitely getting, I'm definitely getting a vanilla custard kind of thing going on the nose. Colin Bell, this taste reminds me of Lockett's. Now, <laughs> Lockett's- Cough mixture. Cough mixture sweets. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. When you have a cough or you've got a sore throat. Um, I get that. Chris May getting the honey and chocolate. Michael Smith, this smells great. Honey, creamy, cacao, hints of vanilla cream. Gerard McNeely, rhubarb and custard sweets. Absolutely rhubarb and custard sweet, uh, sweets. Eddie Marshall, yes, honey and lemon locket. You've really got a, that, that's a, a lot of people saying that now. But El Sutton getting peach as it opens up. Peppermint on the nose for Ian Bullock. And Jeff, I'm getting a creamy blue cheese kind of note in a nice way. Yeah, it's really cool. And just remember, this is 46% ABV. So we're not going in a kind of like a standard um, easy win gently. The ABV is slightly higher. So if it is feeling like a little bit hot, I personally am finding this really quite smooth and mouth filling. But if that warmth is a little bit too much, like feel free to add some, like a couple of drops of water. But remember, you can add it in, but you can't take it out. So do go steady with it right there. Yeah, it's a lovely kind of dark chocolate kind of note on the finish, which is really, really lovely. Mm. Um, Ian Connolly saying it's super interesting on the nose for sure. Peachy, yeah, peach was the first thing that I got on the nose. I have to say, just like instantly smelling it. Jacob's mm. Island, wow, that's smooth. Mike Thomas, so a very lowland whiskey. Yeah, I suppose so. Um, yeah, so some great notes, guys. Please keep on coming in with those notes. Christy, yeah. did you go in the Dead Sea? I did not. So I stayed in Tel Aviv, sadly. Um, I mean, not sadly, Tel Aviv is an amazing city. Um, it was, New York is described as a city that never sleeps. I swear Tel Aviv gives it a run for its money. I arrived at like midnight and the bars were full. It was like a random Wednesday. I was like, why is everyone up and out? I mean, it's part of that. All around. Yeah. And it was just before they hosted Eurovision as well. I'm a huge Eurovision fan, just fitting that out there. Yeah. Um, there's some other things I really want to flag about it. I, honestly, it was such a fascinating place to visit. Um, so the distillery's got a really cool visitor centre. So if you do get to visit, definitely check it out. It's well worth like stopping in. They're doing all kinds of fun cocktails. The bar area is gorgeous. But their philosophy was to make a Scottish style whiskey. And that's why I found really interesting with the lowland whiskey tasting note, because we're talking like double pop distills, like, and one of the stills, the wash still, um, was sort of, they said rescue, like a rescue still. Um, it came from Romania of all places. So they found this still, they really wanted it. They thought, oh, that's a really interesting shape. We'll get that. Um, and then I'm pretty sure that the spirit still, so with your two distillations, is like a traditional, like modern, like a Carl still from Germany. So. Um, although they've got the more traditional setup that we'd recognize from Scotland, um, yeah, there's some quirks there too. And then the other thing I wanted to talk about, so not relevant for this whiskey, this is the classic one with the STR casks and the virgin oak and the bourbon casks. But because they don't have to play by the Scotch Whiskey Association rules, um, which is where you can only use like traditional casks, although they have broadened it a little more recently, um, they're experimenting with all kinds of things and they are doing so much stuff. I tasted whiskey that had been finished in a pomegranate juice cask. Like so nice, right? pomegranate, pomegranate. Like what? I say, it's not this one, but um, I just feel like they're doing really interesting, really exciting things. Um, there's lots of different wine casks and maturations they're doing. Um, 
really, really cool. So Jeff, how many distillations is, is this? This is double pot still. So super similar to how like loads of scotch would be made, um, the same kind of process. So um, you've got your grain, you're fermenting it, in this case for, yeah, 72 hours, and then it goes through your double distillations. Then you stick it in your casks, put them wherever you want. In this case, some of them down by the Dead Sea, some of them in Tel Aviv. Um, and yeah, this is the result. Um, so this is the first, as I say, like, what, core collection, that's the word I'm looking for. Um, so I imagine it's maybe four years-ish. It's still really young. And we know that because they started the sling in 2015, so there might be four to five years, maybe a touch of like maybe six-year-old and absolute push. I suppose, but, I suppose three years in Israel could be Scottish, maybe, you know, it would be much older in Scotland. You know, we've we spoken about this with Australian whiskey before as well. You know, in, in Australia, it's three years, could be a 10-year-old Scottish whiskey because of the climate. And I suppose it's quite a changeable climate in Israel. Super, super humid, super, super hot. Yeah, exactly. And when I was there, I think it must have been, I really can't remember what time of year. It was very hot. I went, I swam in the sea. So yeah, I think like it had been Eurovision. It must have been June. I'm going to say June. Um, Eurovision was May. We went in June. Um, and yeah, it was probably like 30 degrees, like 27, 30 degrees. So really lovely. But then when you're talking about casks maturing, down at the Dead Sea, that can easily hit 50 degrees. That is too hot for me, but if you want your rapidly aged whiskey, then that's literally perfect. Um, so that's fabulous. So um, a question from Jacobs Island, is this natural color? I honestly don't know, I can't tell you. Um, so distilleries don't have to disclose this information. Um, I'm gonna find out for you actually, slide into our DMs um, at Pour and Sip Club and I will seek that info out. Um, because they were so open with production, I feel like, um, yeah, I'll drop the team a line and they will, yeah, definitely let us know. So with Caramel Colour E150, it's really common to use and it literally is like for consistency across batches. Um, any sort of producer, blender, distiller, whatever you want to call it, worth their salt, will only be using it to colour correct ever so slightly. You shouldn't be able to taste anything, like don't be scared if a whiskey is with natural colour. It doesn't actually affect a lot of the time the flavour of the whiskey. Yeah. So it's kind of a lot of people kind of get funny about that. But it is like you said, it's done for consistency a lot of the time, especially if you're releasing kind of core expressions like this, which you know, you've got thousands and thousands of bottles. Mm -hmm. Um so yeah, quite a good, lot of comments coming in, Christy. Uh, Ian Jambo Rain, really surprised by this. Nice spicy kick on the top of the honey. Good work, milk and honey. Mm, <laughs> yes. Uh, water took away some of the spice from me, enhanced the chocolate. I've been ha I actually haven't put water in this yet. Did you put a bit of water? No, in? I haven't. Do you know, I haven't got a pipette here, but I'm going to give it a go very tentatively with my absolutely enormous thing. Um, Paul has just turned up in the chat, which is true. He's talking about American whiskey. So if you've got your bourbon or your rice, by law, 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 they have to be natural color. In terms of what I was saying about caramel color, this was my scotch mindset, the fact that they're making scotch style whiskey here in Tel Aviv. Like, and if you're not governed by law, like bourbon and rye distillers are, they're not allowed to do this, then it's other people might have it. But very good point, Paul. Thank you for- yeah, proves that he's listening. <laughs> he is, we can't get him. You know that Paul, Andy? Yeah, exactly. No, but bourbon and rye, I mean, America, the, the, the regulations for production in America are way harsher than in, in Scotland and much stricter yeah. than they are in Scotland. We've spoken about this before when we had New Riff and we spoke about the Boston Bond Act and mm. we spoke about these kind of things in America. So, yeah, um, maybe we can discuss that with Paul as well when we taste a few. Um, mm. Paul Langley says it's too sweet for him. Uh, Ian Bullock saying the barrel char coming through, it's lovely. Yeah, I get a bit of barrel char and it's coming through kind of mm -hmm. toasted char. Um, James Burke Meyer, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, baklava, pastry, honey, pistachio. You know, I'm with you on the pistachio and I just did put the tiniest amount of water in and it's made it like even sweeter, I think, and I'm, and some of that nuttiness too. Yeah, uh, soft and basic finish, Ian Bullock, you can tell it's young. Yeah, I think, I mean, what we said, probably about maybe three, four years maybe. I would say four to five, I reckon, uh, oh, yeah, about that. Which we were saying would probably, because with oak maturation, and um, remember that our casks are watertight, but they're not airtight. So as you know, the temperature increases or decreases and you've got like a bit of movement, it's gonna be drawing the spirit into the staves and out again. We've talked about this a little bit before, you've probably heard like our analogy about how it works. Um, and imagine that just being accelerated when you've got loads of humidity, loads of temperature fluctuations, it's really hot. All it does, it speeds up the aging process a little bit. It's all completely natural. It's actually quite amazing. 
Absolutely. Green tea is green, actually, saying, which I agree with. Um, beautifully subtler on the palate after five minutes of being poured. Mild, spiced, creamy chocolate. I agree. It's really tempered itself after about five minutes of a bit of air in, in, in the glass. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Velocity Tim, do you know what's behind the brand name, Milk and Honey? So if I've got this right, and I might not be, I'm not completely up to date with my religious texts. I think Israel is known as the name of milk, as the land of milk and honey in the Bible. So they've sort of done that because they were the first distillery to produce whiskey in Israel. Actually, funny story, when I was flying over, um, flew with El Al, good old Israeli airline. And they, like, if it's if you're not from Israel, they're like, why are you going? Who are you seeing? And they'll be like, where have you been before? And I was like, I'm going to visit a whiskey distillery. And he actually said to me, there are no whiskey distilleries in Israel. I was like, um, I'm afraid you're wrong. There are a handful. And actually, the one I'm going to see was the first. So, yeah, it's really quite hilarious, like, how, um, like, considering the quality of this, they're the first producer. Like, there was no whiskey being distilled in Israel until, like, 2015. Can you imagine? And now there are a handful of distilleries. And there's, like, a little, yeah, a little region situation happening, which is fabulous. I can't believe they didn't realise that on customs, of all things. That's <laughs> I was like, I promise, I promise, this is why I'm going. It's all legit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, just really, really fabulous. I really enjoyed this one. I think it's, for me, I love discovering new producers from new regions, new countries. And it's just such a joy. Like, the, the rise of wild whiskey is just, I don't know, it's incredible to witness. And we've had whiskeys from all over the place in our boxes, right? Well, on Pour and Sip, that's been, I mean, we've had so many whiskeys from all over the world. Chrissy, there's a Eurovision kind of uh, thing in there for you. Wasn't there an Israeli entry for Eurovision called Milk and Honey, Hallelujah was the song? Chrissy, how good is your Eurovision knowledge? That is the question. My Eurovision trivia is not that good, um, but I think it was Netta who was my favorite Eurovision entry from Israel of all time, but yes. Yeah. Yeah, and there was Dana International, I do remember that, and she won. Yes, Many you are years. correct. Yeah, um, and to the side, let us know your favourite Eurovision entries. I because have Eurovision it's trivia as well. <laughs> I do have a, a, a guilty, a uh, bit of a soft spot for the Eurovision as well. I love the Eurovision. Yeah. It's so great. But yeah, so that's Milk and Honey. Fabulous stuff. Um, I think it's a great dram to kick off the month. I know I'm biased, I'm very excited, I'm a bit of a fangirl for this distillery, but it's great. So, on that note, let's see if Paul is around. Um, I can't actually see him. We'll give him a sec to come back and um, we'll hop over to the US. Here he is. Here he He's is. Back. Um, let me bring him in. Hey there, Paul. How are you doing? Hey, doing great. Glad to be. Yes. So lovely. I'm going to leave you in Andy's very capable hands, but I'm going to be sipping along. I've got my dram right here. Very excited. Oh. And I can't wait to hear all about what you're doing with Rye and all these wonderful other things. Awesome. Yeah. Huge fan of what Milk and Honey is doing over there. They're uh, Good folks making some great stuff. Yes, they are awesome. So yeah, have fun and we'll catch up in a bit. Cheers. Hi, Christy. And um, now we can talk about her. That's it. So, how are you? What's what's going on? You're based in Chicago right now, aren't you? How's the weather there? Yeah, it's a little chilly. It's about uh, minus two, minus three right now. Um, a little chilly, but not so bad. We're we're used to it here. It's uh, a little bit colder than it is in London. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so for any of, uh, anyone who doesn't know about Pew or about Paul, um, Paul is the founder of Pew, but Paul, talk to us a bit about your kind of path into the whiskey industry because it wasn't kind of a traditional path into the whiskey industry. No, I, you know, I'm the, yeah, like I said, so my name is Paul. I'm the founder and distiller here at Few Spirits and Few is a grain to glass distillery, which what that means, we actually make all of our own whiskey ourselves, uh, kind of the way most people think that people actually make whiskey. Um, I kind of got into the whiskey business a little bit, uh, probably a little bit late in life because I've had a couple careers prior to this. But what I really have always liked to do is to make and create. Uh, to be a pro guitar player, I've built guitar effects pedals, and you know, making stuff that really kind of gets me excited and get, makes me want to keep on doing stuff. Um, and so, kind of late in life, I've kind of kind of ended up in this whiskey business. Uh, based on a little bit of history. Uh, prior to World War II, my grandfather's family owned a major brewery in what's now the Czech Republic. Uh, 1939, Nazis invaded, as I assume everybody's aware, uh, but they uh, confiscated the brewery and murdered the entire family in the camps. Um, <clears throat> Grandpa survived, obviously, because otherwise I wouldn't be here. Uh, but, you know, he spent the rest of his life after the war trying to get the brewery back, but never did. 
And when he died, it kind of struck me that all of this family legacy and history is gone forever if I don't do something about it. So few is in many ways just really trying to rebuild and regain that family legacy and that family connection that has been a part of us uh, for for so long. That's really interesting, and um, that's really cool. That I mean, firstly hearing as well that you were a guitar player as well. I'm a, I'm a drummer by trade, so maybe I want one day we'll find as well. That's a, that's a career change that uh, is uh, <laughs> it's really 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 inspiring to hear. I have to say, my, my band practice is just on the other side of the computer screen from you. Uh, I'm looking at the drum set right now. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> What's he? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's probably not good for you. You probably wish he chose the uh, the flute or the guitar, maybe if you put headphones in or something like that. Yeah, it is what it is, man. Rock and rolls, uh, rock and rolls in the blood. Yeah, I, I spent my whole youth getting complaints from neighbours from too loud music. So, I mean, I probably understand where you guys will be coming from as well. Richard Francis asking a question about: um, Is there a Chicago naughty sense of humour that led you to call your distillery after Francis Elizabeth Willard? Cheers. And um, we'll get on to that because I'm obviously going to ask you. So, your the distillery is located in Evanston, if I'm pronouncing that rightly. Correct. Yes, yeah, so we don't have a Chicago address. We're in a city called Evanston, uh, which is the first suburb immediately north of Chicago. Um, so if you're in the area, people are like, oh, Chicago, that's Evanston, bra. Uh, where I'm talking to somebody from London, we're in Chicago. Um, you know, where I'm sitting right now, we are actually, this is probably a, a full three kilometers from the city limits where I'm sitting right now. And our production facility is about, about two kilometers from the city limits. So like, no, it's not in the city. We don't pretend it is, but uh, um, right next door. Yeah, but talk to us about Evanston because you had to work pretty hard to be able to set up a distillery yeah. there. So the interesting thing about being in Evanston and why it's important that it's in Evanston is that the entirety of US prohibition was effectively started here. Um, the group of women that promoted prohibition in the US uh, women's christian temperance union because of course it has to be religious based because that's the world um but you know they're not their home base was here because the city of evanston was actually founded specifically to outlaw alcohol and so because that was true and then you know the only reason there's a city is to outlaw alcohol it served as a really natural home base for miss willard uh, again you know Francis Elizabeth Willard. Many people do see that similarity. Well, it is a sheer coincidence. Uh, uh, but Miss Willard was the second head of the WCTU and certainly the most famous resident of Evanston. And again, it's relevant to the story of few because I'm the guy that killed Prohibition dead where it was born. Um, I mean, that was the, quite a lot. Yeah. Many trips down to the air. Uh, to, uh, to speak and to, you know, essentially be able to kind of change those laws single-handedly, essentially. Yeah, so I lost track of city meetings after 15 of them, um, but we got it done. And so when we fired up the stills, we were the first alcohol ever produced in Evanston. Um, we were before any breweries, we were here before cidery. I'm the guy that killed Prohibition where it was born. Um, and so- Is that going you know, on your team, then? It doesn't make a difference in the glass. You know, what really matters when you're drinking whiskey is what's in the glass. Yeah. But it does add for a nice little bit of a story that. Uh, I, I think it's super important that distilleries have a story as well behind them. And that's such a great story as well. It really kind of helps you connect with the, um, with the distillery. Um, you said you're a grain to gr glass producer. I mean, which I assume is quite a lot more costly than buying stocks of whiskey. Talk to us. I mean, right. that's super important to you, right? To be a grain to glass producer. It's, it's super important. I think that's really what, it's really kind of who we are and it's what we are and something we're really proud of. Yeah. Uh, obviously there's nothing wrong with sourcing whiskey or we're not throwing stones at anybody, I'm not saying anybody's a bad person. But when you're setting up a new distillery. Yeah. But when you're setting up a new distillery, I got into this business to make whiskey. I did not get into this business to make money. I got into this business to make whiskey. And so if I was trying to make money, I'd do something else. That's for damn sure. This is a terrible business to make money at. Um, <laughs> but it's a rewarding but, business because you're trying your own stuff. 
you know, and you get to, you know, we make liquid art every damn day and we put that liquid art in bottles. Um, that's, that's the stuff that's fun. That's what gets us excited. And so we talk about being grain to glass. I think it's really important because that's who we are. It's, it's why we are, you know, yeah. we exist to make whiskey. We do not exist to make money. You know, we are here as I like making whiskey. Everybody that works here is here because they like making whiskey as much, if not more so than I do. And I'll tell you what, man, I love making whiskey. Yeah, <laughs> so it's lucky you do because this stuff is amazing. But I think it's really important now. I mean, with the craft whiskey is booming industry, especially in America at the moment, it seems like every week there's another kind of distillery popping up. <laughs> um, it's, it's, I mean, is it difficult to stand out as well in that industry? Because being grain to glass and being so kind of true to those roots must help you stand out in quite a crowded market. Yeah, yeah. Cer certainly, the market continues to get more and more crowded uh, every day. Uh, you know, when we started uh, almost ten years ago. There was the market was wide open. There are maybe like thirty people across the country making whiskey grain to glass uh, outside of the Severn traditional giant uh, Now there's a lot more, and I do think it stays a little. It, it could be a little challenging to stand out on the shelf, but I think that's where again the quality. Of the liquid is going to come out. I think we have some of the best liquid out there. Uh, the quality of the branding is going to come out. We've got a great brand. Like we've got you know, the quality of your ethics and your integrity are going to come out. I think we've got, you know, we've got integrity. We operate with ethics. Um, so I think sure. it helps. The, the, the consumer is so much more, you know, people are joining clubs like this because they want to learn about whiskey and they want to try different types of whiskey. Um, you know, it's harder now to pull the wool over people's eyes because people are so well read about it. They want to research and they want to go deeper into it and they want to try something that's transparent and that is kind of, um, yeah, absolutely, like transparent. So I think it's really important. So I kind of totally get that. And, I and think if actually we make our own means we can shape it and make we can make the whiskey taste the way we want it to taste. We can pick our own mash bill. We can pick our own yeast. We can pick our own fermentation regimen. We pick our own barrels. We pick our own char. We pick, you know, how long they're in barrels. We pick how they, you know, we pick everything about the process. It's not just looking at an Excel spreadsheet and going, I want barrel number 12 dash this. Uh, we and we sweat. Everything you, said, everything you said previously about kind of your, you know, how you got into this industry, you're not in it to make money, you're in it to make whiskey. That's, you know, that's exactly it. Yeah, it's, that's what we, that's why we do what we do. The money, I mean, yeah, this is how I feed my kids. I've got three kids, including a teenage boy, so my grocery bill is outrageous. Um, <laughs> this is how I feed my kids, but it's art. And that's why we do it. Uh, and we're just really lucky that our, you know, people like our art enough that we can keep on doing it. There's, uh, sorry, Paul, there are so many comments coming in right now that I've, that I've skipped over because it's just so such a pleasure to talk to you about this. And it's such an interesting story. Um, I've got a couple more questions, but um, someone uh, is saying that uh, there are still numerous dry countries and um, principalities in the United States that restrict or prohibit liquors. Is that the case? Oh, there's a, definitely a lot of places that restrict uh, production of liquor, consumption of liquor, sale of liquor, uh, you name it. It's definitely very, it's very different. And the relationship that the United States has with alcohol generally could be, you know, it could be a 10 hour Zoom on its own, yeah. just addressing the intricacies of the relationship that we have but alcohol is it's treated very differently here than certainly it is in the uk where i think like a lot of the scars of like the gin craze disappeared relatively quickly yeah but in the u.s the ghost of prohibition continues to affect well hopefully there's more people like you that go into those states and kind of want to set up distilleries and go through all the paperwork in order to do that. Um, right, Paul, we have to try this whiskey because I can sense the time getting away from us. So this is the few rye whiskey. Yes. And um, someone's asking, um, how does your, I, I think they mean, how does the rye whiskey differ, differ from the others? I think he's talking about the others in the few core range. Sure. So, so 
yeah, you go ahead. Talk, talk us through this draft. So Furi, I mean, how it differs from others in the range, and we'll start off just by talking about what Furi is. So rye whiskey, uh, our Furi comes from a mash that is 70% rye, 20% corn, 10% malt. So kind of right in between most other rye whiskeys that are on the marketplace. Uh, virtually all rye whiskey comes out of one of two distilleries, uh, one in southern Indiana, one in western Alberta. Um, ours is not, you know, again. So 70 rye gives you some really nice spice character. Uh, think about rye, you know, if you think about rye as being a relatively spicy grain, it carries through into the distillate. So 70% uh, rye in the mash gives you some nice spice. Uh, adding in that 20% corn should give it a lot more depth, uh, complexity. It'll add a little bit of sweetness, not a whole lot. It is only 20% of the mash is that sweet corn. So, but it does add depth, richness, and complexity. But it's top, not Yeah, and on top of that, we use a wine yeast for the ferment. So we get a wine yeast out of the Loire Valley. We ferment that spicy and sweet mash with a wine yeast, which gives it some really nice kind of fruity character in the mid to the finish. And you end up with what got named Craft Whiskey of the Year by Whiskey Advocate Magazine. Uh, we just won a, I don't remember where we got the gold medal, got a gold medal here. Uh, we got we got awarded a best in show last year for rye whiskey, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so we get an awful lot of critical acclaim, which goes to support the fact that Few Rye Whiskey is the number two, or sorry, the number one selling craft rye whiskey in the United States. Um, wow, congratulations on that. So, people <laughs> like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, and, and judging from the comments, people definitely like it. Pat Cowling, Black Brin Orange for me with a hint of diesel. Uh, Ian Turner, teak oil for me. Uh, Jay Moon, I get charred corn and sweet pears. There's so many tasting notes coming here. Rob Bester, quite a strong smell in the bottle, but getting toffee in the glass. Uh, Lord Crispy on the nose, I get toasted almond, brown butter, vanilla, brown sugar, molasses. Joe F, I'm getting charred, burnt oak, peppermint, and a honey sweetness. Um, someone also says, Richard Francis, Paul, you're my hero. So, um, <laughs> big fan. Uh, Eddie Marshall, polished wood and an old. Oh, oh my kids. They don't, they, I'm definitely not their hero. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, Scott G00, Turkish Delights and Foam Bananas. Uh, there are just tons of tasting notes. Um, uh, Jeff, it's quite a dry drink on my palate. Ian Connolly, I get the smells of maraschino cherries from this few rye. Um, Jacob's Island, uh, it's uh, mustier than the last, if that makes uh, sense, but no means is that a complaint. I really like it. Mike Pizarro, love this guy's philosophy. Whiskey, good too. Green tea is green, surprising the difference between the fairly subtle nose and the sharper bite on the palate. Um, there are just tons of questions. Guys, it's so difficult to get to all of yours, but I will try my absolute best while trying to chat to Paul as well. But if you do have any questions for Paul whilst he's here, because we will have to say bye in about five or 10 minutes, um, please get them in now, because I'm sure there's something you want to ask him. Yeah, I have a lot of questions. Yeah, my tasting notes. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know who said pears, but pears are very a very common tasting note that I give. Uh, somebody talked about maraschino cherries. Totally agree. I usually talk about tart cherries more so than maraschino, uh, but we were talking about you know shading of some pretty fine gradations there. Uh, I talk about plums, pears, cherries, um, but you still get that nice kind of black and white pepper spice. A uh, little bit of sweetness. I don't know that I get a whole lot of sweetness usually, but that sweet and the fruit really play together. And I think a lot of times sweet can get perceived as fruit and fruit can get perceived as sweet uh, until you're doing exactly what we're doing here, which is really digging into it. I mean, I know it's quite obviously it's a prevalent rye note on the nose. Obviously, it's this wonderful rye bread, but there is a sweetness underneath it that you wouldn't get necessarily with 100 percent rye whiskey. Um, like a lovely that corn is kind of giving it and I know a butterscotch vibe underneath it, a toffee vibe mm -hmm. underneath it was really, really beautiful. Just interesting because we were talking about milk and honey and the climate there. I'm wondering what the climate in Chicago, how that affects the aging process for you guys. Well, it definitely affects. So we are, we're probably a little bit, we're going to be a lot colder at our coldest than they're going to be in Israel. And we'll probably be a little bit less hot. 
Um, so in the summer, we'll be looking at the you know, temperature summer can get up to maybe 45, 46 Celsius uh, in our rack houses. And in the winter, you're probably talking about four or five Celsius in the rack houses, maybe a little bit colder than that. Um, we do heat them so that it won't freeze. Uh, outside, obviously, we're in Chicago, but it, it freezes. Yeah. Um, but uh, we, you know, we have sprinklers here, so we can't have our sprinklers freeze. Uh, that would be bad. Uh, yeah. But you get sprinkler water everywhere, and it's a big mess, and nobody wants that. Um, that's the last thing anybody wants. Last but you know, so, but I think you know, we get hot. We get really hot. We get really cold. Um, we get really damp. We get really dry. Uh, yeah, I think you really get a good wide temperature range, which is so important for aging American or aging American style. Yeah. Um, you've got a couple of there's a couple of philosophies for aging. Uh, neither is better or worse than the other one, but we go by an American one. Lots of temperature variation. Um, we're talking about. I, I forget if it was you or. Uh, Christine talking about, you know, expansion and contraction of the volume of whiskey in the barrel. Uh, it's for us, it's so important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's obviously going to speed up that aging process for you guys. Um, and you don't, uh, you don't really do age statements, do you? A few. No, we don't. We I don't believe in aging, so we don't. And I was, I also kind of bristle at the concept that it speeds up aging. I don't. Aging is aging, whether it's heated up or not. I, it doesn't matter. What matters is the result. Uh, I would say it's a different aging, and so you're going to get a lot more wood extraction, and that wood is going to have much more effect on the flavor using the American style than you would in, say, Scotland. Uh, whether that's good or bad, I think, is just different. I, just, I wouldn't say it's faster. I would no, say it's at the end of the day, you're trying to reach the same place, aren't you? You're trying to make good whiskey regardless of kind of the right. age and how long it's been aged for. And, you know, American whiskey is going to have a lot more oak influence on it than Scotch will. Yeah, in, sure. part, in part, that's because of the aging regimen with hot and cold and hot and cold and hot and cold. Uh, part, part of that's also we use new barrels. The Scots primarily don't. Um, yeah. We're going to have a lot more temperature. We're, I'm sorry. We're going to have a lot more wood influence in a new barrel than you will in a used. That's just reality. Yeah. Um, cool. Just a couple more things. Joe F saying so smooth, but with a burst, such a burst of flavors and an edge of spice. I thought I didn't like rye whiskey, but oh, how wrong I was. <laughs> Welcome. Yeah. Welcome to rye whiskey. Yeah, exactly. Richard Francis saying, are there any plans to scale up? You know, we've been scaling up for quite a while. Um, but as you might guess, scaling up in whiskey is a very long-term proposition. Um, so are there plans? A absolutely. There's plans. Uh, I think we're kind of in the middle of our fourth expansion now. Uh, and we're starting to lay the plans for kind of our, you know, realistically we're probably laying our plans right now for like our seventh or eighth. Uh, as all that, you know, all the whiskey every time we expand continues to kind of stack up as it ages. Um, so we've got a whole bunch of, you know, we're scaling up, we're working on it. Just takes time. And lastly, put uh, your Uncle Banya, I'm going to ask this question right at the end when Paul comes back and all three of us about asking us on the other um, of Hughes range. David Woodlock's asking, um, Chicago is known as the Windy City. Do you get breezes through the, to the distillery? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's definitely windy here, although uh, what I think a lot of people don't understand is that the name Windy City actually has nothing to do with the amount of wind we get here. Um, the name Windy City is actually an insult. Uh, <laughs> but, um, uh, but funny enough, it's an insult that relates directly to the entire few brand. Uh, because our brand is based on the 1893 World's Fair that was based here in Chicago, and the name Windy City was applied to Chicago based on all the yapping and the hot air that our politicians were talking about to get us awarded the 1893 World's Fair. 
So it's not, it's actually not particularly windy here, um, but uh, the name stuck. So such is life. <laughs> yeah, I didn't actually know that. So that's really interesting. Right. I think we're going to have to say bye to Paul, unfortunately, for the time being, which is a real shame. But thank you for joining us uh, with your wonderful rye whiskey. We will talk afterwards um, about the other stuff in the few range and other stuff because someone else has asked what else could we try. Uh, so probably time to welcome back Christy so we can get through to our last dram, our waterford. Here she is. Oh, hi. How are you doing? I'm all good. How are you? I'm good. I mean... I really, I'm a big fan of rye whiskey, and this one is so beautiful. It's for me. I don't know if it's because the milk I previously was so sweet and like full of red fruits, but this to me is like really green and kind of like almost like medicinal kind of eucalyptusy stuff. Real eucalyptus and kind of cut grass notes, kind mm. of there, which is really, really lovely. Yeah, utterly divine. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Paul. It's been so great listening in, and you're going to hang on for the last sort of fifteen minutes, right? And then we'll zip you back and we'll, we'll continue do. our chat. Fabulous. Thank See you, you in a Cheers. Awesome. Andy, that was so great. Oh, I love it when our guests go like into a deep dive, not just about the whiskey itself, but their experiences, the distillery, just all of them, the whole shebang. Such an interesting story as well for everyone behind that distillery. So that was great to hear what Paul, and, and actually this is being, uh, people are saying a Batman joke is saying best guest in ages. So congrats. And everyone said Paul's his hero. So everyone's saying the same thing. Paul has been a great guest, Ian Turner. So yeah, hopefully we could try another few products one day and we can get Paul back on. Yeah, fingers crossed. But yeah, hold your questions for him and keep them coming in because we will have a chat with him, all of us, um, just before we zip off for the night. But we have one more whiskey to taste. I don't know where the night is going. It's <laughs> Sorry, a bit. I, I, I just the time. And we've saved a whiskey with so much to talk about. Oh my gosh. Okay, right. So I feel like... Everyone who follows Whiskey Geek News, particularly on Twitter, is going to have a view on this. So if that's you, let us know. Um, but Andy, tell me where you are at on the whole Tawar in whiskey thing. And also tell me how to pronounce Tawar as well. Okay. I've been pronouncing it Tawar, um, but I could be wrong. So uh, please let me know. Um, my viewpoint is that, well, Mark Rainier, who set up this distillery, was the ex-director of Gugladi. Um, and obviously Brew Gladdy kind of started looking at kind of Isla Bali, Bear Bali, local Bali, and we've, we've seen lots of kinds of distilleries like Springbank have just released another local Bali edition. If anyone got their hands on that, please let me know because I really, really struggle and still haven't managed to find it. Uh, but anyway, um, and it's really interesting to see how Bali can affect, because we don't really talk about Bali and whiskey, which is really strange considering it is of three ingredients, water, yeast, and barley, we don't really talk about where the barley comes from, the provenance of the barley itself. Um, so that's what's really interesting. And I think terroir is a thing, because it's a wine term and it's not really, a, you can't really translate terroir from French into English, there's no real translation. People kind of get confused about it and they get scared about it. But um, it's actually pretty simple. But basically Waterford is a, a kind of barley centric, that they're, they're basically focusing on the barley, that first ingredient and that is that goes into whiskey and what's super interesting is they're basically tracking each farm they've, they've got about 97 different farms that they've kind of they're, they're kind of using um, and 19 different types of soil that these farms are using and basically what is the terroir where well, it's just the kind of interaction between the soil the microclimate and the place on that plant on the barley well that's super interesting because be, because of their releasing different kind of batches from different farms so they're really single farm origin. So basically a whiskey with barley from one particular farm, we can basically kind of compare and see how that barley is different to another barley on a different farm that might have had a sunnier climate. And if you do buy a bottle of Waterford, um, I have to say, please get the terroir code because each bottle comes with a terroir code. And you can basically, I've never seen that much uh, what's the word, transparency and that much information about where where the barley has come from and what that whiskey has been through. It's at that website, the Waterford website, it's just, I mean, you could get lost if you're a geek about barley and kinds of fermentations and yeast and all of this kind of stuff and the stills. I mean, you would just get lost in that website. 
Um, yeah, for sure. And I absolutely love it because I feel like Mark Rainier has been such a champion for transparency in the industry. Um, so, yeah, at, at Brook Laddie particularly, but, um, you know, there's been campaigns in recent times where people like Compass Box have wanted to disclose the different component parts of their whiskey and they've been told by the Scottish Whiskey Association that they can't because the rules are all around minimum age, right? So kind of off the back of this, people including Mark Rainier have been like, but it's my product and I want to be able to tell this story. Um, so yeah, if you have a look on his site, there is all the information and it's incredibly, incredibly I mean, rich. The one thing I have to say as well is that he stated as well, it's not necessarily wrong to do it the other way and to you know source your barley. And, and, and Paul was saying this um, as well, but he champions the opposite side of it. He wants to basically go further in depth about barley. We're not just talking about, is it local barley or it's barley from Ireland. We're talking about the actual farm that this mm. barley and the effect of terroir. Terroir basically affects, like I said, the microclimate, the soil, and the um, the place and time on that plant. Um, yeah. And that is super, super interesting. Why do more people not do this? Well, because you're not going to get a good yield from one single farm of barley. So if you're releasing a massive release or you're a huge distillery, it might not be so simple as to just kind of use one single farm. And the, the dram we're about to try is an organic whiskey using only organic barley so you know with a very very low, low yield so i mean yield being how much you know you make out of that barley so super interesting but you've got to have a real passion behind you to be able to kind of focus on this thing because like paul was saying paul was saying he's not in it for the money he's in it for the whiskey i feel mark Rainier at this point in time even though he would definitely would have made himself some serious money from people Laddie, is focusing on his philosophy and what is important to him and that's kind of transparency and the ability to track where the barley has come from and yep. I think it's super duper interesting. A hundred percent. And I think it's so hard to do, right? Like, it's not like you can be like, wake up one day and be like, I'm going to track all of the information about the whiskey that I've got on my shelf. No, if you're going to do this properly, you've got to do it from like day zero and keep yeah. records and track everything back. Because remember, whiskey, when we taste it, is a minimum of three years old here in, in the UK and the EU. So, um, you've got at least that lag time that you've got to think about this stuff, which is fascinating to me. And as an aside, David Walcock has filled me with great joy. You are safe on the pronunciation. Terroir is different from Burgundy to Bordeaux. So thank you for that. Um, but the other thing with Waterford, not this whiskey in particular. Also, please let us know in the comments that like, your taste notes are coming in, which is fabulous. But let us know what you think. Eddie Marshall has said, I'm yet to be convinced that terroir can have a discernible effect on the finished whiskey after distillation and maturation of several years. It doesn't stop the whiskey being tasty, though. So, yeah, all of these views, whether you're team terroir, like, yeah, of course you can taste it, or you're team sceptical, it's just really interesting to hear. Um, something else that I want to get your take on, Andy, is um, everything around a biodynamic whiskey production. So we've talked about terroir, which is interesting. This isn't a biodynamic whiskey, but others from Waterford are. And this is all about kind of the philosophy of planting, right? And it's even tapping into things like the lunar cycle. So when, a, when plants are planted at the different stages of the moon cycles, and there's all kinds of things as well about you know, living soils, not using certain types of fertilizer, but the whole thing to me is just whether or not it has an impact, it shows an attention to detail that I think at this barley stage is mind blowing. A hundred percent. But I, I think the thing is that you're, uh, you're not going to get lots of distilleries doing this. That, that, that's the thing. So it takes someone who is essentially a champion of a certain thing like this, like Mark Rainier, to be able to set something up like this. And yeah, I mean, do we taste the difference in this? Will you taste this in a blind tasting that it's made from organic barley? I'm not sure. I don't know how good, you know, what, what the difference is. But the interesting thing for me is we can try the difference between an organic whiskey here, or you can try the difference between different Waterford products to truly come up with the kind of the difference in those different type of barleys. And for me, that's the important thing. It's not that this is the right way or it's the wrong way or other whiskies should be doing organic biodynamic whiskies because, you know, cost wise, is it cost effective? It might not be. So that that that's the really interesting thing. But it's interesting to have someone who's a champion of it. And like you said, he set up the distillery with that in mind. It's not like he has a distillery and think, I'm going to champion by you know, This has been set up specifically so he could carry on what he was doing at Brugladi, which again, they do micro provenance, lot, lots of focus on provenance and terroir, but go the whole hog, let's say. And that's kind of where I stand with this. And I think it's really, really great yeah. to see someone championing it like that. 
Yeah, really, really fabulous. And yeah, just a bit of backstory as well. Waterford's a fairly new distillery. I think their first release was 2015. So um, similar kind of timescale to Milk and Honey, really, in terms of their setup. An interesting question from Jeff. You've mentioned the SWA a couple of times. Are they in danger of holding Scottish distillers back when the rest of the world is being more adventurous? So just to bring everyone up to speed, the SWA is the Scotch Whiskey Association. They're like the governing body, if you like, of Scotch. And trade bodies like this, in my view, hold a really valid role in kind of like quality control, right? So with the rules, in my view, some of them, um, things like it has to be aged for three years in oak and things like um, maximum, minimum distilling strengths and bottling and going into cast filling strength. That's the word I'm looking for. And things like this. And it's so useful because it means that people can't copy scotch. It means you know what you're getting in your bottle. Um, and I have certainly haven't meant to have come across like it's all negative. But I do think that it's almost like a disadvantage to scotch that it can't innovate in the ways that other people can. I think there's a trade off. I don't know about you. I, I think there's a trade off. Absolutely. And, and, and I, I think the scotch whiskey, is, I mean, I don't know. I think it's, it's also important to really protect the values of scotch whiskey as well. And that's why we love it quite so much and i think it's just a board that protects those values just like you would with champagne for example mm. you know, protecting those values and these are the codes and ethics and it's the same in america as well as course i mean the laws are even more kind of strict and, and stringent in america than they are for scotch whiskey uh, yeah. in america they have to use new oak whereas in scotland they have more opportunities to use different types of a new american oak in scott uh, in america but obviously in scotland they can use different types of oak. um so european oak as well so yeah there are really stringent rules but i do also think it helps protect the provenance of scotch single malt whiskey um yeah. and i think it's really great because it gives the other chance chance for the world whiskey to really truly experiment and kind of kind of you know stand out in a market when people might only want to buy scotch whiskey and it's really interesting to see how world whiskey is kind of rising to kind of challenge scotch whiskey so yeah i do think it you know, there are certain things that are holding the Scotch whiskey industry back, but I do also think at the same time it's a trade-off because it's really important to protect those values of what's made it so special. However, yeah. I feel like, I can't believe what the time is, Christy. I really can't. Well, we I should get all and taste it, right? I feel like we can talk about tawar and whiskey and biodynamic production and whiskey rules. For goodness sake, as soon as the pubs are open, this is what we're going to be doing. They're not going to be able to kick us out because we'll be there with our drams, arguing and debating, bring it on. Anyway, what have we got on the nose? Ian, well, so just one quick, Ian Bullock saying he's Gaia, um, Gaia, sorry, 1.1, the Terroir code. No, it's not. That's the name of the actual whiskey itself. The Terroir code would be on the back of the bottle, and you can type that in on the website. And it's important to add that this is not a single farm origin from Waterford. This is actually a blend of different farms. Why? Because they're organic. It's organic barley, and the yield just isn't good enough, and not there's just not enough to be able to get a, an expression yeah. from one single farm. Waterford hope that in many years to come, there will be a single organic farm in many years to come, but it's just not at that stage at the moment. So it's kind of, they've taken a batch of different organic um, barley and yeah. Yeah, bottled at, what is it? Bottled at 50% and there's, uh, yeah. So should we give it a nose, Christy? Yes. And I've just sort of been having a little bit, for me, it's so malt forward. This is so all about the raw material. It's being allowed to shine. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you a secret. This is a controversial, unpopular opinion. I'm not big into beer. And sometimes whiskies are so grain forward and so malt forward and so malty that it almost reminds me of that. But this has got a real freshness to it too. I feel like it's so authentic and it's so off the grain. It's really, really interesting. Funnily enough, actually, Waterford um, set up the distillery, which they basically took over a distillery that was used for Guinness. And I, <laughs> it was owned by Diageo. Um, and they kind of didn't have to do quite as much to set up. So that's uh, maybe the beer thing is also coming in there. But uh, no, I'm getting a kind of huge lemon curd kind of note. It's very lemony. And um, yeah. like I said, malt to the grain is quite obvious. And it's, yeah, I mean, look at, there is a slight kind of um, funky note, which I really, really like. I'm, I can't quite yeah. pinpoint it at the moment. And uh, someone else is actually saying uh, it smells like tin mackerel, not liking the you note. Know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm uh, not getting a mackerel. Maybe triple check your glasses, Glenn, possibly. But you know, sometimes you do get these funky notes that come through. And oftentimes they're things that have come maybe from a slightly quirky fermentation, which is really, really fun. But there are great tasting notes here. So um, there's green apple, white pepper, creamy toffee from Sean. Um, we've got 
all kinds of people. Um, I'm losing myself in the tasting notes. David's getting apple, cinnamon, spice, sweat, and cream. Uh, <laughs> it's really interesting. Lord Crispy, banana is right, very front of the mouth. Um, really, really interesting. Other people are getting fish as well. Maybe it's my nose being off and I'm not getting the fish. I, I get there's a funky element to the nose when mm. I get I, I, I personally wouldn't think it's necessary. I, I, I'm not necessarily getting fish. I am getting a seaweedy, maybe kind of sea breeze kind of element to it. Yeah. It is uh, on the southern eastern coast of Ireland, the distillery. Right. Um, so maybe the sea breeze is affecting the whiskey. I'm definitely getting a seaweed kind of note. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Colin Bell, Andrew Joseph. Main thing is, where do you get your poor and tip, sip T-shirts from? <laughs> um, luckily, the uh, um, well, I've just been told we will be getting them on the shop in the shop super soon. Uh, that's a tongue twister. Shop super soon. Um, I got this luckily. They, they, you know, luckily working. I, I managed to get myself one, but hopefully they'll be in the shop super soon, so we can. I feel like this is significant breaking news. And again, when we're all allowed out as a group, we can all. Be geeks and meet up in our matching t-shirts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And actually, okay. another comment saying there's actually been three of these saying, please extend uh, this to two hours. Yeah, I, I'm, I can't believe we've already reached half eight as well, where we okay. usually uh, be finishing this. Grain, uh, Gareth Peters, so weird. I'm not getting any of the fish, but I'm getting creamy biscuit cheesecake thing. Mm -hmm. Reminds me a little bit of the drum shambo. I think I'm down with the Irish. However, this is an Irish single malt, so it's not a single pot sauce. There's no grain in this. It is just 100% malted barley. Yeah, I am getting a creamy, that kind of creamy biscuity note as well, kind of bottom of the cheesecake kind of uh, crumbly biscuits uh, kind of. Buttery biscuit base right there for all the great British bake fans. Hundred percent creme brulee as well. Once more kind of creme brulee yeah. nose. Um, this is a really interesting nose. I have to say, I think this is one I'd like to sit in the glass for quite a while because there's like it's just so interesting. Mm, there's definitely like a pepperiness and a greenness to it's quite yeah sort of quite a savory one for me should we have a taste i feel like i've had my nose in this and i'm like oh i need to taste it so yeah cheers everyone third and final drown of the night mm. oily so oily do it so we're saying it's single malt so there's no unmalted barley in this 100% malted barley. Yeah, I mean, because the texture of it does make me think of that sort of linseed vibe that you would traditionally associate with that. So yeah. that's really interesting for me. Mike Thomas drinking the stout followed by this whiskey is a wonderful mixture for an evening. Good to follow the tradition. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah, there's uh, loads and loads of tasting notes coming up here. Apple, cinnamon, spice, sweet cream, David Stanton. Um, and a lot of people mentioning also about the, the Scotch Whiskey um, Association, the rules, the regulations, Ian Connolly saying it protects the pedigree and provenance of whiskey. Um, so yeah, absolutely, that, that's what that's what I was saying as well, definitely. Mm -hmm. I feel like it does protect the end. But let's not go on that tangent, actually, again. We're discussing Waterford. Yeah, um, we are. We spent a summer in Waterford. Fantastic weather and one of the most beautiful coastlines. Maybe Do you know one. what? I once stayed on the outskirts of Waterford, sadly not to visit the distillery, but I completely agree. The coastline is stunning. And actually, I feel like when things are open up again, Cork's not that far away where Middleton is. So there could be a little like whiskey pilgrimage on the south coast of Ireland. I think that would be dreamy. An Irish whiskey pilgrimage. I'm in, Christy. Definitely. Definitely. On that note, and while we're sipping our wonderful Irish whiskey, shall we bring Paul back and we can just have a bit of whiskey geekery to wound off the evening? Let's see if he's there. I believe he is. Hello, Paul. Come in. Come in. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> How are you faring? How are you doing? Uh, doing pretty good. Just uh, working on the emails. Is, that's the modern life, right? <laughs> Tasting whiskey. Oh, cool. there was a. I, I, I forgot to ask. There was a question that came up, um, which was discussing as well. So while you're here, and we've only got a few minutes left, about the other kinds of expressions you've got in the few range, because there are only a few. Yeah, and exactly. that's, not meant to be, that's not meant to be. Planned, <laughs> I, I, I own the few jokes. Um, I've, I've got a few of them. Uh, no, so our, our main products are the few bourbon and the few rye. A uh, few rye is obviously what we're talking about today. Few bourbon is our other primary skew. Uh, that said, uh, and indeed, I believe uh, Ma Master of Malt just launched today uh, one of our new innovations, which is our Immortal Rye. Is that, you're you're nodding, Christine. So I, I'm guessing I'm right. Um, and so the Few Immortal Rye just launched today. You guys could be some of the first to try it. Uh, 
and what it, that the immortal rye is that same rye whiskey that you just tried uh, but usually when we bottle our whiskey the whiskey comes out of the barrel we add water and it brings it down to bottling strength so it comes out of barrel about 62 to 66 percent abv and we bottle it at 46 and a half uh, with the immortal rye instead of using water we use a cold extracted oolong tea and so what that cold extracted tea does is bring in some really i don't want to say aggressive much more fruit flavors uh and instead of those kind of stone fruits we were talking about earlier the pears and cherries the immortal rye has a lot more honey peach and dragon fruit uh, maybe a little bit of mango uh, it adds some kind of tropical fruit flavors than the more fruit. And we're really proud of it. And it's a fantastic dram. Even if it doesn't qualify as whiskey anymore, uh, it's what's in the glass that matters. You can call it you know, whatever you want. If you like drinking it, it doesn't really matter what the name is. That's true. I'm so fascinated by that flavor combo. I have got really into tea over the last year. I think there's obviously the lockdown, not being able to get out, but loose leaf tea, oolongs, interesting greens, all of this. So I'm so, so fascinated by this. And I just double checked the bottle is there on Master Report. Sadly, not the poor and sit member store. But I'm thinking if there is any left, you'll have to come back and chat through it again at another time. That would be really fun. Anytime. Yeah. Have it come back anytime. But that's, uh, that's one we're really excited about because I think it really also pushes whiskey in some different ways. I know we were talking about the SWA. Uh, I think people would have an absolute conniption in Scotland if somebody tried to do that. Uh, but here in the US, uh, we're just, people are only having strokes. They're going, you can't do that. <laughs> um, I think, I think yeah, well, it's not whiskey anymore. I'm like, no, I agree. It's not whiskey anymore. It's different. That's OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, I I totally get that. Just before we go, can everyone also, we, as we always ask at this point in the evening, uh, if you all want to let us know which your favourite has been out of the three that we've tried tonight, and Paul will not be offended if you say any of the other two. Um, but Look already, at you say, Waterford's great. It's people are already commenting anyway, uh, and few is getting a uh, few is definitely the best in this box, says Michael Smith. Um, is is that? Uh, <laughs> Paul, what have you? Um, what are you kind of? Is there anything? I mean, obviously you're so focused on uh, few, but is there anything else you're drinking at the moment that's kind of tickling your fancy? Oh, uh, I'm really drinking a pretty, a reasonable and responsible amount of uh, tequila, uh, in particular tequila ocho. Um, I'm just really, really, really enjoying that ocho. Uh, only a state grown agave brand out there. It's a vintage tequila. And I just, I love the way it really balances the tequila flavors with I a little a hint of, <laughs> yeah, you've, you've probably got the, uh, the EU bottling. I've just got the uh, US bottling. <laughs> um, but I just, I think it's a magical liquid that is fantastic. Yeah, I am so just in love with the fact that across spirits categories, there's so much flavor forward, provenance driven, um, really carefully made spirits that are so readily available now. And I think Ocho is such great value as well. It's so well made, so well considered. If you're dabbling in tequila, that's definitely one to go for. I think it's super important as well to switch it up as well. Like we drink, I, I mean, I drink so much whiskey as well because I love whiskey, it's my main passion, but it's so great as well to get into other stuff. I like a glass of red wine of anything or a tequila. I love Añejo. So, I mean, it's really important to not have that kind of palate fatigue from just continue just drinking whiskey. It's important to drink other spirits as well to really train your palate. The comments coming in are going to really please Paul, obviously. <laughs> but <laughs> I think we, uh, Rob Bester, few, Jeff, Milk and Honey, Guy Wilson, few for me, Ian Turner, few, few, few. Your uncle Vanya, few. Simon, Rob, another vote for few. Nicholas Stephen, few is favourite. David Norcross, few. Ian Jambo Rain, few. Oh, few and Waterford didn't really do it for him. So he's saying uh, Milk and Honey. Ian Connolly, few for him. Batman Joker, 66, few. Eddie Marshall, few. Ride by a Country Mile. El Sutton, Waterford. Michael Smith, few. Jonathan Williams, few. 
I'm really glad. Although I'm actually going to shout out Gareth Peters, who is cheating and is saying, going to say all three for me, first time I've liked all. I'm glad Which you liked all. Right That's not how you play the game, Gareth. The wide variety of flavors is the joy. That's what makes whiskey fun. Uh, that's why whiskey's great. Different people like different things. Not yeah. everybody's gonna like few the best. Only a few people need to. Come on. Come yeah. on. We're all I got a few of these teed up. <laughs> you specifically named a few for the puns that you can have in live tastings. Um no, I mean it's that is so true. I mean, we tried obviously comparing a rye whiskey to a barley centric whiskey to then an Israeli whiskey. You know, it, 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 it's, it's difficult, but that's the whole point of this. Uh, and we've said it many times, Chris, here, pour and sip, is every time we're getting such yeah. a breadth, kind of different, a plethora of kind of different whiskies. It's so interesting to be able to try all these different things. But, if if yeah. whiskey all tasted the same, it wouldn't be fun. No, that's exactly it. And now <laughs> they and I really feel like as well, like, and I'm not just saying this wearing my pour and sip t-shirt, but we genuinely like argue sometimes over what whiskey is to put in these boxes we pick out ones that we genuinely love all that are brand new and we just want to share them so really really pleased that you're enjoying them and it's thanks to people like paul that we have them to enjoy so amazing stuff i'm not sure if he's frozen he may still be around but um but it's been such a fabulous evening everyone enormous thanks to paul for joining us and a tremendous thank you to you all because I don't know. It's just been so wonderful. So many comments, so many questions. It's been hectic and I have adored it. Do you want to answer that last question, Christy? Sorry, that's just come up. Um, uh, Paul is back. He's back. So um, oh. one final question to round off. Um, this is from Ionis, I think. Apologies if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. I probably am. Um, in my mind, the US is mostly known for its bourbon, which is mostly corn. How or why did you choose rye? What's the thought or selection process? Uh, so I th the way I'm interpreting the question is that why are we using rye rather than corn, uh, yeah. rather than the actual individual rye breed or supplier that we use? So I'm, 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 I understand the question to be a relatively large scale one, which is great. Uh, if I misunderstand the question, I apologize. Um, but you know, we make rye because I like it. Um, it's not really a huge complex thing. Like, why do we make rye? Because it tastes good. Um, there's a bunch that I really hate about making rye. Um, Typical grain. Rye grain is expensive. Uh, rye grain not yield much alcohol. Uh, rye is extremely difficult physically to work with. So making, making, or the process of making rye sucks, but you end up with something that's magical and it's worth it. It's a terrible business. It's not, <laughs> it's a terrible business and I just don't care. I love making rye whiskey. We love rye whiskey and we Again, we don't do it for the damn money. We do it because we love it. Do you, do you um, have a, I mean, because obviously a lot of people ask as well. I Sorry, I know I'm carrying on when we're just about cocktails with rye whiskey. Because, I mean, rye whiskey is such so important in cocktails in Manhattan. So. Yep. Sazerac, yeah. my favorite cocktail. But um, what, what, what would you choose to put a few rye into a specific cocktail? So typically, yeah. I mean, obviously, Manhattans are the number one rye cocktail out there. Uh, I personally, I just love Boulevardiers. And oh, so yeah. if you're asking me what cocktail do I usually get with a few rye, it's probably going to be a Boulevardier 70% of the time, maybe 15, 20% of the time in Manhattan. Um, but, uh, you know, I'll drink rye whiskey a whole bunch of different ways, you know, neat, rocks, water, cocktails uh there's exactly zero wrong ways to drink rye other than uh not in moderation or responsibility always drink in moderation <laughs> <or> responsibility. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> uh thank you uh thank you my regulators uh <laughs> but drink, drink your rye whiskey however you like just as possibly in a moderation um 
put it in Coke if you like. I don't personally like the texture of spirit and soda. It's like I don't drink gin and tonics. I don't drink whiskey Coke. I, I don't like it that way. Uh, I'm the weird one. If you like it that way, drink it that way. It's it's awesome. I, I don't. You do? Hell yeah. Knock yourself out. Enjoy it. Um, and if you don't like Boulevardiers, as most people probably don't, don't drink a Boulevardier. <laughs> Have fun. Enjoy it. I sit around with your friends like we're talking about and argue about how, which way is better. Or me to argue, but discuss. Hey, I really yeah. like this. Hey, I really like that. Awesome. How about Arsenal, man? What was that? That's a hell of a game from Arsenal the other night. Um, that's what it's about. Whiskey should be bringing you together with your friends. Whiskey should be bringing you together with your family. That's what this is about. Enjoy it. Or with the wonderful community we have here on Pour and Sip. It's bringing us all together tonight, which it has been. Like, yeah, we're all sitting on Zoom because because COVID sucks. But uh, we'll be at a bar again soon, hopefully. Definitely. Do you know what? I feel like things like Pour and Sip and just – doing stuff together in real time, even if I'm literally sitting in my dining room looking at a laptop, it's still, you know, we're tasting it together. We're geeking out together. I love this so much. And I'm so grateful for you for joining us, Paul. I'm so grateful for everyone for tuning in, doing your tasting notes, you know, asking questions. A few things though, before we round off, we'll be back on the 15th of April with our part two of the box. So if you can resist drinking your drams until then, I highly recommend holding off because we'll have another guest and we'll be geeking out some more. And we have a question about the May theme. Do you want to indulge everyone in what the May theme is going to be, Andy? I can. Am I allowed? I think we can give a sneak peek. I think we should. I think we should. It's exciting. <laughs> yeah. It will be regional. Um, so we, we, we've had our, our theme back in April, which was, um, oh, sorry, March, Jesus, uh, which was Women in Whiskey, which was super successful and you guys all really enjoyed. This time we're going to be choosing a region in Scotland for um, our May box. Yes. Do you want to say which one or do you want to keep them guessing? Um, maybe we can reveal more on April the 15th for the next one. Yes. But yeah, we're going to be honing on one region. We're going to be really getting to grips with the full flavor spectrum from there. And I can't wait, but we've still got two more amazing drams to get through from this box. So we don't want to jump ahead too much. And yeah, it's going to be really great. Um, and don't forget to check out the Pour and Sip Digest because we go like underneath the skin of all these distilleries in the box. So you can find out more there and check out the store as well. Like price is just remembers. So awesome yeah. stuff. Lots of love for Paul as well. Chris Randall, love you, Paul. Great philosophy. Mike Suffliff and good old boys drinking whiskey and rye. Mike Thomas, Paul, you are a legend. Sean McCarrick, we need you back, Paul. Our buyer's awesome guy. So yes. uh, I think we'll, I'll be back. I got my shot this week, so uh, I'll be free. Uh, I'm free in like 12 days or something. Okay. <laughs> we'll have you. Hopefully next time we'll be in the tasting room in person. We'll have you there. That'd be fabulous. I, I'd love it. I can't wait to get back over. Amazing. Awesome. So I think that's probably it for now. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. It's been amazing. I've had such a great time. Um, yeah. And we'll see you again on the 15th. Bye, everyone. Cheers, everyone. Take care. Bye.